Let me read to you a passage from the 11th chapter of St. Mark's Gospel, verses 11 to 26. It's the Gospel for Friday of the 8th week of ordinary time. St. Mark writes, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple area. He looked around at everything, and since it was already late, went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing from a distance a fig tree and leaf, he went over to see if he could find anything on it. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves. It was not the time for figs. And he said to it in reply, May no one ever eat of your fruit again. And his disciples heard it. They came to Jerusalem, and on entering the temple area, he began to drive out those who were selling and buying there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. He did not permit anyone to carry anything through the temple area. Then he taught them, saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples? But you have made it a den of thieves. The chief priests and the scribes came to hear of it, and were seeking a way to put him to death. Yet they feared him, because the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. Early in the morning, as they were walking along, they saw the fig tree withered to its roots. Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus said to them in reply, Have faith in God. Amen, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it shall be done for him. Therefore I tell you, all that you ask for in prayer, believe that you will receive it, and it shall be yours. When you stand to pray, forgive anyone against whom you have a grievance so that your heavenly Father may in turn forgive you your transgressions. That's from Mark chapter 11, verse 11 to 26. We are led to think of prayer. What do I mean? Well, there is, of course, nothing more fundamental in religion than prayer. We could put it more plainly by saying that there is nothing more fundamental in life than prayer. Man is a rational animal, yes, but in our current intellectual climate, a definition such as this can favour a view, a view of life, that leaves out God. Any militant atheist, such as, for instance, the Oxford campaigner for atheism, Richard Dawkins, would happily accept that definition of man because usually the modern atheist flaunts what he regards as his scientific rationality. But prayer and religion, he would have none of it, and would regard prayer as an indulgence that diminishes a man's rationality, and so also his humanity. Prayer is a crutch, a prop, a flight from a hands-on involvement with life and the world. Such is the contemporary blindness of many, and it is sadly fueled by the irrationality of many forms of religion. I would favour a definition of man which, while placing at the centre his rationality, also includes his capacity for religion, and more precisely for prayer. If for good philosophical reasons we are to place man in the category of animal, then let us include among his distinguishing characteristics not only his capacity to reason, but also his capacity to pray. Observe the discussions among anthropologists and historians of culture. The religions of the, of the societies they investigate are at the centre of their deliberations. Rituals, myths and temples are the stuff of their publications and congresses. Where man has been, their religion has showed its lively, lively face. 
the voice of mankind would seem to suggest that if the life of the reason is central to our humanity, so too is the life of prayer and religion. Well then, what does Christ, the Redeemer of man, say to us about prayer? We cannot take a single reference from the Gospels and consider it as providing a complete account of the teaching of Revelation on prayer. But every reference is precious and in fact often surprising. Consider the Gospel passage I I read a few minutes ago from Mark chapter 11 verse 11 to 26. Our Lord enters Jerusalem and goes into the temple area and is obviously far from pleased from what he sees. He leaves and returns the next day after having left a potent sign in his curse of the fig tree. He returns to cleanse the temple forcibly of all that is not prayer and reverence for God. Christ is insisting with vigour and unyielding insistence on the profound reverence which man ought manifest publicly to God his Father. God our Father is a public fact and temples and churches attest to it. But all too often, the reverence due to him in and out of our churches is lamentably lacking. We talk, we look around, we do many things on entering and passing our time there, but are tantamount to irreverence and neglect of the divine presence therein. In every Catholic church where there is the tabernacle, the great God abides. There God the Son made man and risen from the dead dwells, and where he is present, the Father and the Holy Spirit abide also. How great ought be our reverence, and how often ought we advert in a form of spiritual communion to the real presence of God there. But there is this too. Not only is Christ ever present in the Blessed Sacrament, but he and the Father and the Holy Spirit dwell within the soul of the baptized person who is in the state of grace. If we are in the friendship of God by grace, the Holy Trinity dwells within. How great ought be our reverence and how genuine ought be our life of prayer. As we think of Christ cleansing the temple, let us resolve to stamp our life with prayer and to make it prayer with genuine reverence filled with the thought of God. Let us resolve to cultivate a life of genuine, reverent and loving prayer to God. God dwells within the baptized soul in the state of grace, and he abides within the tabernacle where the Holy Eucharist is placed. Let our prayer of reverence be trusting and confident, and let us bring to God our Father all our needs, knowing that, as our Lord plainly teaches in our Gospel text I read earlier, he will hear our prayers. God is our Father, we are his children.